This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. What's up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the conversation we're going to have today. I had the pleasure of being on our guest podcast recently. We had an incredible conversation. And I really want to dive into something that is an important cultural force I think that we're dealing with. And that is a lot of how men, the family, women, how we deal with pornography and a lot of what it's doing to our society. He spent many years helping people in the fitness world and uh, has been pretty fit himself, so I'm excited to dive into things. Our guest today is Frank Rich, also known as Coach Frank. Frank, thanks for hanging out with me today, man. Jeremy, it's an honor to be here, brother. Thank you for having me on. So I have to ask first and foremost, because if you look at kind of your background, you have kind of these two unique worlds that you've been in, and the first being that you spent a lot of time in the fitness world as a stage competitor, helping other people, but you're also helping people to, you know, free themselves from, you know, pornography and what it does to you. So how do these two worlds come together for you? Yeah, man. Great question, Jeremy. And first off, you know, it's an absolute honor to be here on your show today. So really looking forward to wherever you go, hopefully bringing some value to the audience. You know, my introduction to fitness, man, I was a insecure, overweight, kind of shy kid, you know, growing up. Was an athlete, but there was one specific event when I was around 13 that really changed my life. It was a summer growing up in South Florida here. I was spending some time with my cousin who was about a year older than me. So I was around 13, 14, 15 year old girls. And I can remember that summer not wanting to take my shirt off and kind of the fear and the shame that that kind of came with. And it really implanted this seed in me that like, okay, if I'm not confident in my skin, what the hell am I going to do? How am I going to change this? So I was a kid like, you know, 14, 15 years old. I was watching ESPN, you know, workout shows. I can remember the Flex Wheelers, the Sean Rays, like they used to have these Saturday morning TV shows. You could watch cartoons or you could watch men working out. Well, something about just the development of the physique. I was into wrestling. I was just into big muscle men. So that planted it very early on. My journey into bodybuilding started in my 20s. And I'll tie it together to answer your question here. But, you know, it was really for me, it was something that I felt control over. And quickly, I began to saw some success and begin to see my physique change. I was like, okay, there's something here. If you put in the work, if you follow playing, if you follow nutrition, like you can actually change your life. And I got the confidence, you know, that led me to getting on stage doing bodybuilding. You talked about, you know, coaching other people. I've helped people get on stage. You know, I built aesthetic muscles, helped thousands of guys pack on pounds and pounds of muscle. I didn't know at the time that my journey into fitness was going to lead me to doing the porn addiction recovery coaching because I didn't really get clear on the impact I was having on my life until I was in my mid to late 30s. So growing up as a guy that's almost 40 now, I saw pornography very, very young, but it wasn't the porn that we see today. I stumbled across my dad's magazine when I was five, six, seven years old, maybe, and it kind of planted this curiosity that really carried with me through my entire life. Now, Jeremy, I will tell you, I had a major porn addiction through my 20s into my early 30s that I wasn't even aware about. And this is why I'm Mm -hmm. so passionate about the conversation, because I think when most people hear pornography, pornography addiction, there's no such thing. What do you mean? How do you be addicted to this thing? That's natural. It's every guy's thing and whatever. So for me through my 20s and 30s yeah I was crushing in bodybuilding I was doing shows I was building businesses I was having some success in the corporate world doing a lot of different things what I didn't connect the dots though is like when I wasn't winning I was dealing with a lot of depression social anxiety a lot of a lot of what I thought I was masking or 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 growing out of with the fitness was actually manifesting itself in different areas. I was very socially anxious. I had a lot of confidence issues despite being the six foot three, 240 pound jack dude. It's like people would see me. They'd be like, why is that guy got any type of confidence issues? It's because when I'm by myself, I'm had this secret behavior, secret, secret addiction. To not make this too story too long. 2018, I did come to my faith. That's been a big part of my journey, giving my life to Christ and kind of walking that out. And then in February, 2019, probably the 20th time I said I was done with pornography. This was actually the last time. So Mm. 
I'd been doing some research, understanding the neuroscience. I read your brain on porn by Gary Wilson. So I'm like, okay, there's this real thing that's, and it's actually impacting my life. It's impacting relationships. It's impacting how I see people. So that was February 14th of 2019 that I said for the final time, I'm done. I'm fed up with this. This is destroying my life. It's literally holding me back from becoming the man that I know I was born and created to be. And that was it. You know, that was my kind of, you know, defining moment. i am said, I'm done. I started to recruit some accountability into my life, started to share it with a lot of people, shared it with a woman that I was with at the time. And truthfully, Jeremy, like I didn't know that that decision was going to change my life and change thousands of other guys' lives. I was working in a marketing agency. We were crushing it. We were having a lot of success. But as the months, weeks and months went by and I got on the other side and I got away from porn one month, two months, three months, my eyes began to open up. I'm like, Oh, wow. I started to feel different. I started to see people a whole lot differently. And for me, having a background in personal development, having a background in fitness, having a background in high performance, self-development, I'm like, how the hell did I get caught up in this thing with all the resources that I had? I mean, I'd studied Tony Robbins. I'd been to events, seminars, like, and it started to get me thinking, well, if you, this person that studied human nature, studied psychology, studied human performance can still fall into this. What about the men out there in the world that maybe don't have access to all this information? What about the men that aren't chasing high performance? Are they even aware? And then if they are, do they have the resources? So that led me to starting the podcast, truthfully. Like, I just wanted to get my story and journey out there. You know, I had had the fitness company. We weren't huge at the time, but there was a little audience that followed us. So I was able to kind of launch the podcast to at least an audience that was warm with who I was. But those first couple episodes, Jeremy, that's what really changed everything. Because for me, it was taking this alpha male figure, right? Strong, masculine, 600 deadlift, 500 squat, all these numbers, right? Like people saw Frank and they quickly associated Frank, masculine, alpha muscle. For me to open up and say, for 20 years, I've been struggling with a porn addiction and this is what it's doing. It caught up, it took a people by, it caught a lot of people off guard, right? They're like, wait a minute, Mm -hmm. what's going on here? And was quickly caught some traction. So initially the podcast that I started was just to have conversation, share stories. Six, seven months into, you know, the podcast, we got picked up by Apple, new and noteworthy, caught some real recognition, started to develop some early traction. That's when the coaching started. Mm -hmm. So I had this audience of men, you know, a couple thousand people on Instagram, 10,000 people on an email list that had been consuming my fitness content for years. What was interesting though, is the messages I started to receive quickly changed. It went from thank, thank you for your muscle building stuff. Frank, thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for having the conversation that most people won't have. A few more weeks, month go by, Frank, can you help me? Mm -hmm. And at first, Jeremy, I didn't want to. Like I was focused on my career and the agency, doing what we were doing, having fun doing the podcast. I'm like, I don't think I have any way that I could help these men. If you listen to what I'm sharing, just model what I did. Get accountability, build a vision for your life. Do all, like I literally was sharing my entire journey with them. But through the power of network, man, and you know this, the associations of people that you have in your life, I mean, are massive. I was very fortunate to be in some networking circles, be in some masterminds where guys like, Frank, this is your opportunity here. God took you through this journey. God brought you up to this point so that you can now use your story, your testimony to lead other people to freedom. So that began the beginning of Rebuilt Recovery. Now, I don't know if that there's a direct link between the fitness stuff and the porn recovery, although it is a part of our curriculum. I think for me, what enabled me quickly when I made that definite decision to stick to it, I think it was a lot of the background that Mm -hmm. I had. You know, I think it was my ability to, for 16 weeks, deny myself of any thing that I wanted on a food and eat off of a meal plan. My ability to, when I'm tired and I haven't slept great and I'm low on carbs and I'm three weeks out from a show and I'm 5% body fat, get on a step mill for 90 minutes and suffer. I think what I learned there, the development of the character, the development of the man that I became enabled me when I was overcoming the porn addiction, the triggers, the urges, all those difficult situations, I was able to lean into this comfort because I knew on the other side of pain was what I was ultimately seeking. So I think the development of my character as a bodybuilder equipped me to do all the work that I'm doing today. But I think it's a massive part of recovery. If a guy is struggling with porn addiction, 
most oftentimes, I think I was a rare one, right? I think I was the rare guy that had discipline in a lot of areas of his life other than this one. Oftentimes what we see is the lack of discipline that you have with your self-control and your sexual impulses is a byproduct of your lack of discipline in your fitness, your lack of discipline in your relationships, the lack of discipline in maybe your businesses. So we utilize the character building components of fitness, bodybuilding to equip these guys with the tools that they need to actually go out and tackle the porn addiction. So I don't know if that actually answered your question. But no, it, it does. And there's a couple things that I want to dive into off of that. Like, so I, I've got a lot of notes here. I'm actually writing them in silver pen, which probably isn't great for my eyes. But a um, couple things I want to take a look at here, which I think is important. Well, the first I want to kind of dive into, and this has just been my observation. I was a competitive powerlifter all through my 20s. I had a buddy that was an IFBB pro and stuff like that that was my training partner for years. And one of the things I observed, at least in that circle of people, is I guess, how sexualized things were in the fitness world, right? Mm. And I'm curious because, like, I guess what that does for people coming out of that world. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, it, it seems like it makes it very physical. There's, there tends to be people that are sleeping around and doing different things. I'm not just saying this about, like, to make fitness look bad. It's just what I've yeah. observed. And I'm curious, like, if that's also hurting us as a society, if we have to take a look and say, hey, like, it's good to look great. You know, you want to feel good. But at the same time, are we kind of becoming too physical and forgetting about the spiritual part? Dude, man, you are you are literally hitting on a <laughs> reoccurring struggle that I'm dealing with right now. So, Well, because you're, you're looking at, like, I'm such a body, I'm such a body, I'm such a body, I like other bodies. Oh, wait, there's a spiritual realm. Do you get what I'm saying? 100%, brother. So I've literally been wrestling with this, like, conversation in my own head over the last 72 hours. <laughs> okay. I think I share with you, I'm going to turn 40 at the end of the summer. You know, yes. I've done a great job since my last competition was 2016. I really went all in on the business. Oh, dude, I haven't done a powerlifting contest since 2012. So like, you know, you, you've been a lot more active than I have, man. <laughs> yeah. But one thing that I've actually been thinking about is as I'm turning 40, like maybe there's an opportunity to return back to the stage and show people that old man still got it. But for me, it's like, okay, can I justify? And how is that going to look if Frank is this guy that's leading men to freedom from sexual objectification, but then he enters into a world and industry that is purely on objectification, maybe not sexually, but objectification yeah. of bodies. I mean, both male and female, that is what the industry <laughs> is there's nothing subjective about it like in mm -hmm. powerlifting it is subjective you lift more than the other person i liked win. it because it reminded me of wrestling in school i was a wrestler in school so it was like you know i and i'm not a big guy you are significantly taller than me if we were standing side by side i'm only five 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 six on a good day and like you know i could you know deadlift 600 and stuff like that but i don't have very far to go right so it's yeah. like you know anyway <laughs> but you know it's like you win the meet if you lifted more than the other person on a bodybuilding yes. stage it's purely objectifying like i like the way that that body looks better than that one so i'm going to award that person a higher ranking on a scorecard now to answer your question man like god we could go super deep on this right is the fitness industry causing you know destruction socially to the way that people look and see bodies but the walk into and it's gym, strange because i think a fit this is innately good, right? It's a good mm. thing, but this other thing may be coming out of it. Continue. I'm sorry to cut you off. See, here's the thing, man, is I think the fitness industry that we're seeing today is a byproduct of social media. So I actually mm -hmm. think where this conversation is probably going to end up leading us to is what is social media doing and what is just the ability or just the fact that everybody's got a camera and wants a camera on themselves. Dude, I still train at a commercial gym, man, you know, and I don't go at the five o'clock time in the afternoon, but I'll go in there between 10 and noon. That's usually the training time that I have in the morning between 10 a.m. and noon. And at that time, man, there's still five, six tripods with cell phones recording, not fitness pros, literally a high school kid that sees the fitness influencer recording himself. So he thinks that's what he's supposed to be mm -hmm. doing. See, I think, I actually think social media is causing more destruction to the fitness space than fitness space causing to culture. Well, let's talk about that, though, because I think that's really interesting. And I'm trying to remember, oh, gosh, there's a guy I follow on Twitter. And he's always commenting about other people's videos where their videos are taken in the gym. Do you know who I'm talking about? Is this Joey Swole? Are Joey Swole. There Joey we go. Swole, I yeah. Joey Swole for years. But in the last couple of years, he's been talking more about like people's reactions on video. Mm -hmm. I think it really does show us a little bit of what we've become. 
No, 100%. I'm a big fan of what Joey is doing now. I probably wouldn't have said that three years ago because he yeah. was, I mean, he was one of those ones that was like a part of like, look at me, gym culture. I'm famous because I look good and no real other reason. But he's really taken a massive stand, man. I love what he's doing there with calling people out for this negative gym toxic culture, right? And it's like, yeah, just because you are at the gym and you have a camera doesn't mean you own the gym. The gym is a public place like mm-hmm. bathrooms aren't a place where you should be taking your phone this happened to me the other day man like the gym that i train at there's where the sink and counter is there's a hand dryer that comes off of the wall and then mm-hmm. there's a mirror literally that's kind of like right in the same kind of perception of yeah. there i'm standing there after wash my hands just drying my hands in a little dryer and there's a high school kid kind of taking a photo of himself in the mirror but i'm clearly in his shot so I just start waving. I just start waving at the camera. And he looks back kind of like, ha, 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 joking. And I'm like, no, I don't want to be in your picture. Like you have no right to take a picture of me while yeah. I'm in the bathroom. Like mm-hmm. think about that. Like I'm in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. What gives you the right to take a picture? So, you know, I don't know what's going to change this. And I probably sound like a really old man right no, now. No, but you're right. Because I think what's happened is if you look at like gym aside, you look at social media and other things like – We've lost our consideration of others, even though we're peering so social, right? Because we're not considering, well, I was talking to my wife about this. Like, we've been to lots of countries, right? I'm like, could you imagine all the people all over the world that have random pictures of you in their photos and they never asked you to be there? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you're in probably, like, so many people's other photos because of all the places you've been. But it's, like, when you think about it, like, you could probably go on some random person's social media and there you are and you didn't even realize it. But I think we've lost the consideration of others, right? We forget others mm-hmm. exist and social media has kind of pushed us down that hole. Yeah, and not just the consideration of others. I think we've lost the meaning of what physical fitness is. I mean, you and me came from a time where, like, you didn't have a camera. I didn't take a picture of myself working out until I'd been training for 10 plus years. I had like, a flip I didn't phone until join- 2006, man. <laughs> or two, 2000, 2014, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, kids today, like, they sign up for the gym just so that they can put pictures on their Instagram. It's like, it's backwards. It's like, mm-hmm. no, build the physique worthy of taking pictures. And then you don't actually need to take the pictures of yourself. Mm-hmm. People will take pictures of you. This episode is sponsored by My Pillow, um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York on a ski vacation. And uh, I actually have an extra my pillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting and uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that and uh, you want to prevent that, <clears throat> you can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to 66% of select products at mypillow.com. Up to 66% of select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the My Pillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also, this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox, as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So, if you guys want to join me on the parasite cleanse... And uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with. <clears throat> you can head over to bravetv.store slash CYOL. Um, you get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash CYOL. I want to bring us back around a little bit to what you were talking about. I know that that was something that I definitely wanted to dive into, and I think it's important to, to make as a point. But you had mentioned one of the things was what porn does to the brain. And I do mm-hmm. want to talk a little bit about that because I don't think that's something people consider, right? Because I think society makes it so acceptable. And, you know, like it's in everything. And it seemed like, you know, like if you're not that way, then like, you know, there's something wrong with you maybe. But like how does it affect the brain and what things are actually happening to people based on your observation and what you've studied? Yeah. Are you aware of the term supernormal stimulus? No. 
No. Okay. So there was a Stanford research study done. I think it was done in the late seventies, early eighties, and it was done on, they were researching butterflies and they created a, you know, full fledged butterfly ecosystem. And they wanted to study mating patterns of, of butterflies. And what the researchers knew is that male attraction to female butterflies was based upon two factors, the vibrancy of the colors within their wings and the size of their eyes. I guess these female butterflies are the ones that have really big eyes. So two things are kind of the key indicators of like attraction from a male butterfly to female, the size of the eyes, and then the vibrancy of the colors on their wings. So they created this ecosystem where they wanted to follow and and study mating patterns. What they slowly started to do is they would slowly start to drop into the ecosystem, fake butterflies, butterflies that had bigger eyes, butterflies that had bigger, more vibrant wings. Over time, the male butterflies were no longer attracted to the natural ones. They would solely spend all their time literally trying to mate with fake butterflies. And this coined the term supernormal stimulus because what it was doing was hijacking because it was it was super normal, right? It wasn't normal colors. It was beyond what you would be able to actually see in the natural world. And this began to change the mating patterns of these male butterflies. Now you do that long enough, and if that was actually to infiltrate the butterfly ecosystem, like in the real world, I'm sure mm-hmm. you could play out in your mind where that would lead to. If male butterflies stop mating with real female butterflies and solely try to mate with fake artificial ones, that's the end of the butterfly species, right? Mm-hmm. So they coined the term supernormal stimulus. Now, when you have pornography, internet streaming pornography, not talking about a magazine that I saw when I was six years old, right? That had maybe five images on it. I'm talking sure. about an infinite amount of hardcore streaming material that's been highly produced in a way that's going to take over the male brain. It is recognized and called a super normal stimulus by scientists, by the same neuroscientists that are studying that can now link it to our brain. It's the same stimulus that we get with high dopaminergic drugs. So Mm -hmm. cocaine, methadone, the stimulus, super normal. You can't walk out into the same world and have an effect that you would get from cocaine. Same thing with pornography. When you see Endless, streamless, highly produced, perfect angles, lighting, all this, especially with a young boy's undeveloped brain, it creates a new level of stimulus. Now, for him to get that same level of arousal or anything, he's going to have to return back to that. So it begins to change literally the desires, the response, the reward center, the motivation of these young brains. So in short, man, it's literally hijacking young boys' brains, recreating attraction, desire, motivation, anything in terms of reward and pursuit. So yeah, in short, that's really kind of what's happening there. We'll be happy to unpack any of that if you want. Well, yeah. So let me ask you this, because this is the thing that it got me thinking about, and I could be totally wrong about this, but like, you may laugh, Frank, I've never done a drug in my life. I just haven't. Okay. But the question I have, because I hear other people talking about it, like the first time they do it or the second time they do it, they always need more or whatever it may Mm -hmm. be. So let me ask you, when you're looking at stimulus like this, does the ante always have to be upped then? Do you get what I'm saying? Like, so like yeah. you can never look at what's normal again. Do you get what I'm saying? In time. Yeah. And that's desensitization, sensitization effect. Okay. Like that's the clinical term for what's happening there. Right. I'm so, not trying to brag by the way. I'm just saying I don't have reality on it. <laughs> dude, no, it's amazing, man. Like I got a great friend. That's the same way, man. Hats off to you, man. Let, you know, the idiot here that's done all the drugs talk about what's happening here. Right. But, um, no, it's, yeah, it's desensitization effect, right? You know, anybody that's had somebody that's had, you know, alcohol problem in their life and is drinking a fifth of whiskey every single night, that person's probably started with maybe some light beer, maybe some vodka. They eventually got to the point because it's like, I need more and more and more of the same thing. Now you play that out in pornography, we can do a kind of thought experiment. What, what does yeah. that lead to? You know, young boy sees some kind of casual, you know, vanilla sex, male, female, that's the first pornography that he sees. He then returns to that maybe once, twice, It's going to do the same thing to him. Over time, you're now talking about threesomes, hardcore. We don't need to kind of label all these things. I'll let your mind kind of go there. Well, there reaches the point, Jeremy, where the visual stuff that I see on the screen is going to stop working, right? Mm. Desensitization. So what does that then lead to? I can't tell you the hundreds of men that I've talked to that it started with porn and now I'm buying escorts. It started with porn and now I'm paying for sex could open up a whole nother can of worms and talk about human trafficking and how that is going to be eventually where men lead Mm -hmm. to. Cause I don't believe that you ever get to the point of purchasing a human trafficker without having gone through, I'm not purchasing a human trafficker, but purchasing a someone that's been trafficked. Yeah. Somebody that's been trafficked. You don't end up there without having gone through the pornography tunnel first. 
That's a really good point, right? Because it's like, then you've got to kind of keep going for that next thrill in that case. And I guess like looking at that then, Frank, the question I would have, can someone recover from that or can someone come back from that, right? Like, are you permanently changed and you just have to learn to work within the confines of kind of where you've gotten to? Yeah, well, this is the language that we use. You know, it's kind of in the industry, like reboot, right? Like there's a reboot kind of rewiring phase that you need to go through. You know, you'll talk with, you know, former drug addicts, former heroin addicts, alcoholics, and they're like, there was a point where life was literally darkness. The only thing that brought me any type of light would be getting the other drug. Well, that person, three, four, five years, builds their life back up, you know, stays off of it, begins to pursue other goals. They're a new person, right? Like mm-hmm. literally, like they're a new individual. So yes, in short, there is a way out of it. Now you always have the memories, right? Of like, of what I saw, there always may be a possibility. Like if you allow yourself to go back in, you can quickly go back down that hole, but no, 100%, you can reset your reward center. You can reset how your brain responds to dopamine. There's great tools, ice baths. The first thing though, is abstaining from it and allowing the brain to kind of Unwire. So I had a great scientist on, Dr. Trish Lee. She's a 25-year professor, incredible YouTube channel, you know, 150 subscribers, talking all about porn addiction. So she talks about the rewiring process as like two steps, right? So we have to unwire. So if our brain responds in a certain way due to our behaviors, thoughts, consumption, whatever it is, we have to unwire all of that damage, right? And that's abstaining from watching pornography. Now, the rewiring is like the offense. So I always talk about offense, defense. Like I think recovery needs both sides of the team, right? You need defense, like that could be porn blockers, accountability systems, whatever you're doing to stop the consumption off. But then the rewiring is how are you actually creating new neural pathways, new neural connections? What's amazing about the brain, Jeremy, you probably know this, is neuroplasticity literally gives our brains the ability to change up until the day that we die. Guys in their 80s, 90s still have the ability to change, maybe a little bit slower, but our brain is constantly growing constantly evolving, constantly changing. So yes, there's 100% a way that we can change and get back to normal. And I would say for most young men, right, that probably grew up in this society, it's not them returning back to who they were. It's like them actually finding who God made them to be. Mm-hmm. I think that's important too, because I think, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. Like if you look at it, especially like your generation, and I think you and I are probably the similar generation. It's like, if you look at it, we become so increasingly less spiritual as a society. Mm. And I think it makes it much, much easier to kind of reach for these type of carnal things. Do you get what I'm saying? Because we don't have, you know, we're, we're kind of, we think we're doing this thing once and it's whatever it may be. And I think when you look at, there's a bigger reason, there's, you know, a way we have to do this thing. It becomes harder to kind of do some of those things that are just for the body. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I don't know if you're a fan of Jordan Peterson. I'm a big fan of uh, I would of love to interview him, but I, we haven't gotten there yet, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he spent his, a large portion of his career prior to being the Jordan that we all know today. Like, he was a researcher, he was a clinician, professor. He mm-hmm. wrote his thesis, though, on alcoholism. And one thing I can remember hearing Jordan say early on when I was beginning to follow him is that all addiction recovery requires a spiritual transformation. And the language that he was using with spiritual transformation is just that there's a deeper meaning to life. Mm-hmm. For me, that or that manifested in submission of my life to Christ, coming to my faith, and now walking my life out as a Christian. I'm not here to, to, to preach that way of life to anybody. That's what's worked for me. But I think sure. if you can understand that there's a deeper meaning for your life outside of the physicality of these things, right? That's kind of what you're talking about. It's like I have this physical meat suit, and my job here is just to do anything that's going to make that body feel good, right? That's kind yes. of the world that we're living in here today. And we can get into like, is there an agenda behind pushing all that? I know that's kind of right up that's your alley. Kind of I wanted us to go a little bit, and I think we've done a really good job of kind of having the conversation of, like, what is the problem? Now I want to look at wider-ranging society here, because I think when you look at it, it's – I'm trying to think of it like concentric circles, right? Like you have one in the middle, and the further you go out, further you go out, further you go out, it affects more things, right? In the middle, you have just you. But then if you look at, like, let's say you have a spouse, okay, it affects them. You have children, it affects them. You have other groups you're a part of. It affects them. So I think there's a kind of a a rippling of one person having something they're trying to handle or or, or get over. And we don't look at, I think, a lot of times the wider society, what happens, right? Because if you look at it at scale, with a lot of people trying to solve a problem, they're showing up a certain way in their life. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. And yeah, you're talking about the people that are on kind of this side that are in your life, right? Like your wives, your spouses, your relationships, your kids. What about the human beings that are on the other side. Like when you sit down to watch a pornography, like you're not watching objects, you're treating them as objects, 
but those are souls. Those are spirits. Those are human beings. And while, yeah, they may say that they're on their own will, I've mm. talked to and interviewed enough former porn stars and know enough about the industry that most of what we're consuming is non-consensual, man. And, and, and I think, my opinion, is the sex exploitation kind of industry, if you talk about porn, just sex work, and the trafficking is one of the biggest forces of evil that's leading our world right now. Yeah. So yeah, there's a big, big hole to go down here. And I guess looking at that then, like, what are the effects in society then? If we look at I know human trafficking is a big one we've talked about, but like, what does it do to society as a whole if we, I guess, become, you know, as greatly sexualized as we have as kind of a, would you call us a species? What are we as human beings? <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, as kind of a group, when we become more sexualized, like, what happens to, like, society as a whole? Yeah, well, I think one of the first things that we can point to is, is the divorce rate, right? You know, there's kind of some arguments. Is it really 50? Is it closer to 35, 40%? Whatever it is. Like we know that That's marriages right. in the West are failing right yes. now at a rapid, rapid, rapid rate. And outside of finances, infidelity, and you link into that use of pornography is one of the top two, three factors, you know, leading to divorce. So I think it's leading to the destruction of, you know, call it the nuclear family here as well. You know, but you talk about just young boys, right? Average age of first exposure eight to 11 years old right now. That means that we are literally have a generation of boys right now that are in their 20s that for their entire teenage years saw women as sexual objects. This is where they, this is where they get their sex education. You can talk about the abuse, the violence in pornography. It's warping, shaping young men's minds. So I think it's destroying relationships, it's destroying family. And I see it destroying men because if I was going to take over a country, right? You know, mm -hmm. what I would do is I would need to weaken the young men, right? And what are Pacify some ways them. that we can do that? Pacify them, right? You know, so we have, I saw a stat earlier today, 80% of U.S. Americans between the ages of 17 and 24 are unfit for military service. Either I due saw to that obesity, same stat, man. That's a little scary. Yeah, either due to obesity or other medical conditions that they would need some type of waiver. So we're fat, we're out of shape, the boys are weak, there's low testosterone, there's lack of motivation, there's really no masculinity there. So we're developing a, or we're raising a generation of young, weak-minded men that if shit hits the fan, like we don't have anything to kind of stand on there. I guess from that perspective, I don't know if it's a little conspiratorial to look at it this way, but like, do you think that we've also had help in some ways? Like, do you think that there's forces that would want us to have a problem like this yeah man we, we wrapped on this a little bit before recording here right but yeah. uh i watched a documentary this past week and i think everybody needs to check out it's called the agenda I mean, it talks about a few different things right that there was a clear agenda to take down the west and they knew that they weren't going to do it f like through war and combat they need to be done from the inside out right you talked about kind of the society has kind of removed itself from any type of spirituality or any type of faith right like i truly believe like we live in a judeo christian country like the founding yes. fathers built this nation the constitution based upon judeo Christian principles, right? In order for us to believe that we're all given inalienable rights through our creator, that means we're accepting the presupposition that there was a creator. So that's a Judean Christian belief. Now, if I'm going to take that country over and there's a clear agenda that one of the things we need to do is we need to move God out of society. We remove prayer from school, right? You know, so that was one thing. A second thing in this movie is that there was a book called the, I believe it was the Naked Communist. It was written in the 40s or 50s. And they outlined like 50 ways that they were going to infiltrate the country. Two of them in the top 20 talked about how they were going to make pornography, make like sex, just kind of a normal thing. Like, and, and I think we're clearly walking it out. So if, if we remove God from the society and we just make debauchery, like the norm, now we have a weakened society. And I think that's where we're at right now. If you look across at least the U S or at least the West in general, is we have no God and everybody lives in debauchery. So do you think it starts with a spiritual awakening? Is that how you think we get back? Or what do you think is kind of the first thing that needs to happen so we can become better people again? I do, yes. I mean, 100%. If you believe that, that communist is a force of evil, how do you fight evil? The only way to fight evil is with the ultimate good. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think a massive part of this. And that's, if I just look at my journey, right? If, if I just use my life as an example, Frank had all the information ready to quit. It wasn't until he began to actually live a spiritual life out and he removed himself from like, I'm going to do whatever makes Frank feel good and realize that there's a bigger calling and meaning for my life. So 100% believe that that's going to be the only way out of this. So you said for yourself that, you know, like you had 
personally tried to overcome this many times, but 2019 was really that kind of pivotal year for you where you made the decision, you finally moved on for that. I'm curious, looking at that, like, what is the biggest lesson that Frank from 2019 to 2023 has learned that Frank before 2019 needed to learn? Hmm. Wow, that's a great question, man. The biggest thing that I've learned in the last four years that I needed to, I needed to know. Here's the thing, Jeremy. You know, I started reading personal development books in high school. I talked a little bit about it at the beginning, right? Like my journey yeah. into fitness was because I was unconfident. I had some some issues with just how I felt and looked, and, and kind of the shame wrapped up in and around that. And I think through my teenage years and through my 20s, like this journey into personal development was always me searching for something. I didn't grow up in a spiritual home. You know, I probably went to vacation Bible school maybe twice when I was growing up. It was kind of like, get out of the house for the summer, go to this place, (laughs) right? You know, we never talked about Jesus. We never talked about God. I think we went to church maybe a handful of times, usually on Christmas or Easter. So it was like this big undertaking. I was like, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. But for me, the searching, the looking, the, the seeking answers when I came to my faith in 2018, I really picked up the Bible for the first time. I'm like, here's all the answers that I was looking for for the last 20 years. I've read a thousand books searching for all the answers that I could find in one. So I think for me, what I probably needed to know is I needed to know Christ. I needed to know mm-hmm. that there was actually a higher power that was guiding this and put me here for a reason. Because I don't think I ever believed that before. Mm-hmm. Well, Frank, I appreciate your vulnerability. I appreciate your honesty. Really, really enjoyed this conversation today. For people listening, if they want to find out more about what you're doing, if they want to get connected with you, check out your podcast. How's it going to be the best way for people listening to do that? Absolutely, man. I appreciate that. You know, you shared that before we had you on a few weeks back. I'm not sure at the airing of this, but you can find the podcast if you enjoy these long, you know, form conversations at the Superhuman Life, you know, just put that into any platform you'll find us. For me, Coach Frank Rich across all the social platforms, Instagram, YouTube, 10K+, TikTok, we're everywhere. So put Coach Frank Rich into Google, you'll find us. The company's Rebuilt Recovery. If you want to learn about what we're doing with men, you can find us at rebuiltrecovery.com. Very cool. Well, Coach Frank Rich, thank you so much for hanging out with me today, brother. God bless you, man. 